Gail with On Demand Location, and we are here at Canterlock Gardens with DC Douglas. How have you been enjoying your time here so far? Uh, wonderful. It's uh, there's ponies everywhere, and they're magic. Um, I'm having a great time. It's I mean it's unusual that I'm I'm uh, I'm at this convention only because of the stuff that I've done. I, there's not a lot that falls into the pony world. Um, the uh, I'm primarily known for like Resident Evil and Mass Effect, and um, though so, I, so many people have brought up to me little Wesker ponies, um, and then somebody said, "Are you know are they going to have Wesker come on as a pony in in, in a future season?" And I thought that is actually a brilliant idea. So if you really are into My Little Pony and Resident Evil, because you like killing zombies and you believe in friendship, um, why don't you tell the show that they should have a little Wesker pony on in one of the seasons? So. Yeah, but I'm having a great time, and I'm glad that they decided to expand and bring in more types of uh, uh, voice people so that I could have this opportunity. And I'm meeting, they have so many actors at this this, this con, it's, it's insane. So I've met um, Jennifer Hale, who we were in Mass Effect together. I haven't, uh, uh, I've never met her before, but we've been in like these different games together, and so it's been a joy meeting her. And uh, Quentin Flynn, who I've heard about for years, who's hysterical, who if you get him in here, have him do his uh, Christopher Walken, because that's just, it, 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 it's, yeah. it's like yumminess, it tickles me. So I'm having a great time. Awesome. Um, can you share with us some of the most recent work that has kept you occupied? Um, I'm building a bomb. Um, <laughs> don't, I'm not going to set it off in this country. Uh, no. Um, <laughs> uh, uh, oh, Transformers Rescue Bots um, on the hub. We just finally got word that we're doing our second season. We just did, recorded our first episode of the second season. Um, which, uh, coincidentally, uh, Roger Craig Smith is a guest actor on that episode, who is in Resident Evil at playing Chris. And so I, I had Steve Bloom and him in the hallway. Have you seen this video? Oh, you haven't seen it? You gotta go look it up. I did, um, sorry, I'm talking to a guy off camera. I, uh, uh, so I, uh, really quickly, you know, they don't, they record like the main cast together and then the guest usually records separately. Um, so he, we were crossing paths as we were coming out of the booth and I grabbed Roger and Steve and I put them in a hallway and I go, I'm just gonna record a quick little thing here of Wesker being reunited with Chris. And so it's a quick little video and then Steve adds his little tagline to it. And uh, so I put it out on my blog. So go to dcdouglas.com. Um, and then find the blog there, or dcdouglasblog.com. And uh, it's uh, the most recent post. It's got this video on it. It's pretty fun. I think you, you'll get a kick out of it. All right. Um, having worked in voice acting, on stage and on screen, in addition to working in a directorial capacity, um, how has working in all of those areas uh, interplayed with each other and uh, influenced your, uh, your work? They don't get along well together, <laughs> if that's what you're asking. No. Uh, the, uh, inf well, geez. Well, you kind of answered the question. The answer's in the question. Um, they, they, they do that just by the virtue that they're, they're, it's all symbiotic and to a certain respect. I would say what I've learned by being, um, and I was an editor for 10 years uh, as a survival gig, and then when I started producing my own stuff, I was editing my own stuff. So the first thing, the, the most obvious thing, was I would be on set and we'd be shooting something, and I'd get certain coverage, and then the, the, the DP or the first AD goes, you sure you don't want to get this covered? You, want, you just be sure, because once you're in editing, and I'm like, trust me, for 10 years of editing, I know I'm not going to cut to that. I'll, I won't cut. I'm going to cut to that, and I've got it covered. And, and uh, so that it helps streamline the process that way. Um, uh, at being, having been, been an actor first, then you go to direct, you kind of know how to work with other actors. You've got a language that you can share. Um, being as a producer, you realize, you know, I may want that, but I need to make a compromise because I don't have the money, um, or it's going to take that much more time, and I've got nothing if I can't finish the film. So it's uh, it, all of these things, having a little knowledge of all of this helps balance out. And then on the most simplest terms, say when it comes to voiceover, and you're in the booth, and uh, you, record, you record something, and then it goes quiet. And you know they're talking, but you don't hear them. And and for the new actor, or the younger actor, our immediate thought is just because of the nature of, of what we do, we're going, I did something horrible. <laughs> there, how could I just, I'm bad and I'm waiting to hear how bad I was. And usually they're talking about, what do you want for lunch? Because we got to work lunch in here because we've got a cram day and blah, blah, blah. And all you see on the other side is, like, God, I'm horrible, aren't I? So, but so you learn is that there's always these tech things or other things that have nothing to do with you. There's a much bigger picture. It's not just about you and your performance when they, what these people are, are, are working with. So, so it helps to really take the pressure off to have an experience with all these other realms. Long-winded answer, but I'm a long-winded person. <laughs> all right. Um, you also offer voice serv voiceover services out of your own home studio now. Um, <laughs> 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 
some people look at the questions beforehand. I don't. Uh, uh-huh. Uh, what's th- what is the difference been between um, commuting to work and <laughs> communicating from your own home? Well, uh, uh, the difference is, is I get to be in my underwear a lot more. Um, and I love being in my underwear. <laughs> Uh, the well, you know, actually, there's a whole movement when it comes to. I mean, obviously, for on camera, I, I dress up and go somewhere. Um, but the uh, but for the voiceover stuff, there's this whole movement. Everyone having home studios and recording from the studios and sending stuff in. And so, I, with my agents, I I rarely go in unless it's a partner read and they need me to be in there. But usually, it's just. I send auditions from the home studio, so that's just been, and that's, and I, and I really ad- adopted it very early on, um, th- as per suggestion of a, of a voice actress out of Texas, oddly enough, um, and so when most people didn't have them, I was already doing that, uh, so I'm so used to it now. But the, so the home service thing that you kind of brought up, I mean, that's, uh, it's funny, is is I thought that it would only ever be for these like little mom and pa shops in Oklahoma that would hire me to do their 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 commercial. Uh, but now I've you know there's campaigns like major campaigns and I'll have the ad agency say we want to do a, a test session so they don't want to do the full outlay of doing you know a, a, a big studio and ISDN patch and all that they just want to uh, direct me over the phone and so we just do it through my home studio it becomes it's cheaper for them it ingratiates me more to the ad agency that way um, so I mean it's been it's in all in all ways it's been a benefit but I live also in the heart of Hollywood I live in uh, Laurel Canyon so in most of the auditions when I do have to go somewhere to for the voice casting places they're all locally anyway so I don't have I don't I don't know what that life is like for people that get on the freeway for 45 minutes to get to their job and, the, and then an hour and a half on the way home. And I, I, I couldn't do that. And bless you people for who do do that. Why bless? I don't know. But <laughs> just trying not to seem like an asshole and it's not working, is it? <laughs> All right. Did I answer your question? <laughs> I, that answered it very, very well. Okay. Right, cool. <laughs> All right. Uh, when, pe- when playing the character Legion in Mass Effect, there's a lot of unique components to this character. Um, one of them being that it's a compound intelligence and not a single person that's the character and there's also some voice modulation to the character that's done how do you uh, how do you adjust your voice and adjust your your acting style for these characteristics the uh, uh, I adjust the voice by um, letting the engineer do it because <laughs> I don't know how the hell to do that you know it, it, the you first off we didn't know what they were going to do with the voice they really they didn't know what they were going to do with the voice for Mass Effect 2 yeah. so we essentially tried to establish uh, uh, this this a voice that was not robotic but that was not but that was unfamiliar with emotion but not incapable of emotion so it's a, it's it was a, it's a, it was a weird kind of um uh, I can't think of the proper term, but like a, a ethereal, yeah. ethereal uh, no man's land of voice. You know, there's no, non-committal to any emotion, but not flat. Um, and uh, so it's it was it was a very subtle a subtle thing, but it was a very what was nice about it is that it's it's not taxing on the voice like when you're doing the big characters. You know, you could actually just it, I could just live in a nice spot. But also because it was so subtle, when you had off days because we recorded over summer, um, come back in and and it's like you'd have to hear and like tune back into it because it was it, w- it just lived in this little certain range, and. In Mass Effect 3, if you left me alive at the end of 2 or, you, or, or I died at the end of 2, you got a different version of me in Mass Effect 3, depending. So, um, and so that one, there's actually a little more of a, uh, less of a range in one of the characters and more of a range on the other one. If you, if you kept me alive, now you're going to have more of a range. If I was dead, you're going to actually get less of a range. I become a little snippier and all that. So it's funny, as some people going, Thought I don't know why they would think this, but you know, people online are strange sometimes. But <laughs> some people are going, I like Legion's voice better in two, and it's like it's the same actor. <laughs> but that, but that was why partly is that is it was a, two branches in the second one, um, depending on how you how you found me. Again, I answered your question, then I went on to waste your time. So sorry about that. Well, the the more the more is more is better. More is better. <laughs> All right. Um, <laughs> Another character you're you're very well known for is Albert Wesker from the Resident Evil franchise from Marvel vs. Capcom. Can you share with us a little bit about your experience as Wesker? I'm sorry, that's a Stars agent coming. I have to. <laughs> <laughs> um, share, share which one? I'm sorry. Uh, share, you, share with you about your experience as uh, Albert Wesker across all oh the titles, Marvel vs. Capcom. 
Whew. Well, I will say again, go to dcdouglas.com and go to the blog and then look up all the Albert Wesker stuff because I've written a lot of different things about it. Um, and I did a final interview. Uh, it's about a 15-minute interview where I go all into detail and answer fans' questions about it because uh, it's doubtful I'll be ever back because since I'm dead or... Um, so, uh, uh, you know, everyone goes to the little question marks things, but, you, but, but uh, I, I'm not holding out hope, um, though I would love it if I did get a call. Um, but uh, I would say it, it started off uniquely in that I didn't, I didn't know the game, I didn't know how big it was, and the first time I got it, I was replacing uh, Peter Jessup because he was unavailable. So I was matching his voice in that audition, and it, that one was hard because he created such a unique voice. And uh, uh, so I did that, and then when I came back for RE5, at that point I knew it was big, and then I'm, I'm and I, well, I worked up my Peter Jessup for impersonation, and then they played Richard Waugh, and I'm like, oh, okay, and that's a whole other one I got to And then of course the character gets to evolve. So finally, through the process near the end, I got to put my own stamp on it. Also uh, a, a, appealing to Liam, the director and the producers, because they had their vision of what they wanted the voice to do. So it's a very, it was, uh, it was great to play the character, but I never feel like felt like it was completely my own. That I'm always even now when I like do like little fun mock videos for for friends and or for uh, fans and and at these cons when people ask me to say a line or whatever, I really have to struggle to remember which version. Like, do you want the Umbrella Con Chronicles version, or do you want the RE5 version, or do you want what I'm doing in, in Marvel vs. Capcom, where really they kind of let me go, and I just, <laughs> you know, it's like if I could have done the voice from the beginning, I would have done it like this, you know, and it would have been less of the British stuff and, you know, more of the uh, uh, more of the Star Wars, what's his name? Um, young Luke Skywalker. Yeah, yeah, it would be more of that, yeah, because it's just it's more enjoyable to do. Um, so, uh, so that one's a strange one but then when you think when I think of um, Legion Legion's one that it's like that's and it's so so close and, and limited in its range but it's like that, that I know he's all mine and that's what's nice about it where I, I share Wesker with four three other three other actors so yeah all right um, can you tell us a little bit about Transformers Rescue Bots no <laughs> no um, sorry <laughs> Transformers Rescue Bots is awesome uh, listen, you got to get the hub. If you don't have the hub, get the hub. Uh, and if you're watching this and read a My Little Pony thing, you probably have the hub because My Little Pony's on the hub. And so is Transformers Rescue Bots. Um, it's, uh, uh, I'm not going to remember all the names, but Steve, Steve Bloom, uh, uh, Par Parvesh China, is that his last name? Um, oh, I just totally committed myself in trying to say people's last names. <laughs> and I'm horrible with names. Shannon Mc... Kenzie or Shannon McCain, isn't it? Oh, <laughs> and then one more. One more. Amari Williams, I think. Oh, don't trust me on these last names. Anyway, these guys are great. They're all the Transformers. And then, of course, we have uh, uh, Maurice LaMarche in there as the chief, uh, who just won his second Emmy. Um, and uh, directed by Judy McSwain. And, um, and Lacey Chabert is in it. I oh, if I'm saying her last name right. Uh, I mean, it's, it's a wonderful cast. And there's other names that I haven't said because I'm thinking off the top of my head. But it's a, it's a show that's geared towards kids that are like from 5 to 11. Um, but at, at the same time, it's written by uh, uh, adults who like to laugh. So they've worked in a lot of things that they find entertaining. So it's something that parents and their kids can watch it at the same time together and really get a lot out of. And, uh, and, and the episodes, the things that happen are just strange and sometimes a little surreal. So um, there's, there's a, uh, in the very distant back of the show, there's a little psychedelia to it, <laughs> I think. Um, but so anyway, I think I think it's a fun show that people should watch. So. All right. Um, and can I just say that Tim Curry was on it last season? Oh, really? As the villain, and he may return in se season two. Tim Curry. Okay, <laughs> I love Tim Curry. Yeah. I'll always remember him from a Superhuman Samurai when I was a wee oh, a wee yeah. lad. <laughs> no, I, met, I met Tim Curry. So this is ironic. I met him uh, at the ArcLight uh, Cafe like six months before uh, I got the the cartoon. And I went up to him and I said, you know, I'd never do this, but I have to do this. And he's like, I go, I'm sorry to do this. He's like, oh, no, please keep doing it. <laughs> and so we, like, talked. And he was, like, talked for 10 minutes. He was such a sweetheart. And then, so when we're doing the show, I'm like, now I'm working with Tim Curry, my childhood idol. And I go, it'll be great. We'll record together. And, of course, we never did. And I'm like, I never got to meet him on the show that I was doing with him. So. Well, you've done more than voice roles. You've also done a lot of television. Um, but the one thing that I really would love to talk to you about, because we're all Trekkies here, I think, is uh, <laughs> your your little role on Star Trek Enterprise that you had a few years ago. Um, little? No, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. It was little. <laughs> <laughs> um, what, what was the experience like being part of something so um, important to so many people's lives around the world as part of this huge um, 
science fiction entity. It gave me an opportunity to feel as though I could, in each one of their lives, fuck them up a little bit. <laughs> no, um... <laughs> Um, <laughs> I love the way you posed the question. No, I, I mean it's it's Star Trek. I mean yeah. that was it, that was so wild, and the yeah. fact that I got to you know spend two hours getting into makeup and then the contacts and then the, on them this alien. I mean that was so fun, and the uh, and then the, I mean, but I'll tell you that the biggest joy of that entire experience was when we were on the uh, the shuttle coming back to uh, the the ship. And we had to we had to evade the Klingon fire, and so we're literally doing the rock that you <laughs> back and forth. And I'm like, that was I had no lines. You see, I'm only in the background of all the shots, but it's like that to me is the best part of all of it. Like it, that's childhood stuff coming true. Um, well, the weird thing about that episode is we you know they told you we gave we were given the breakdown of what the t personality types were. We we shoot all our dialogue. Turns out the show was running short, so literally a month later they called us back in. Um, and they were extending a lot of our climbing out. They were using a lot of B-roll and footage they hadn't used before, and then throwing in lines, you know, without, uh, not on our mouths, you know, to, add, to kind of stretch it out a little. But they also, some directive came down from somebody in creative that uh, we all needed to be much snippier. They didn't like the fact that we were, you know, we were more like the regular, what's his name on the show, the Dr. Um, Foss, Flox. Foss. Yeah, he was a wonderful actor. Uh, but So we were like a little more like him, and they're like, no, we want these bitchy and all that. Okay. So most all our lines are re-looped. So they're, they're all, where we're like, things where I'm saying, um, well, you better hurry up. To, <laughs> so that's what my face is doing, but then we change it, well, you better hurry up. <laughs> you know, it's like really strange. Um, but it worked for it, so. Yeah, it was great. I loved doing it. Awesome. Um, is there any way that fans can keep up with what you're doing online or through any other means? I, I don't like being on the computer. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> um, I'm, I'm, I'm an internet whore. Uh, there's, if, you, if, you, if you Google DC Douglas and you can't find me, you are stupid. No. <laughs> That's a great way to get new fans. <laughs> if I'm not his fan, I'm stupid. Okay. No, um, I'm sorry. <laughs> Can you tell I'm a little giddy? Um, this is because I just flew here yet last night. Um, the uh, uh, yeah, dcdouglas.com is the website, and from there you can find like all the TV and film stuff I've done. I've got a couple films coming up: Helen Alone and Apocalypse Kiss, which will probably be more up people's alley. Um, and uh, and then from there you can get. I've got Twitter and I got Facebook and all that stuff. All right, awesome. Uh, do you have any final messages for your fans out there? Thank you. Just thanks for, for being fan, being even interested and caring. And, um, and if you like the stuff that I do and you, and you, you, you enjoy the, the irreverence that I have or whatever, do me a favor and check out kiva.org, K-I-V-A dot org. Um, it's a micro-lending uh, organization, and it's probably the key to helping uh, people get out of poverty around the world. All right, DC Douglas, it's been a pleasure. Thank you yeah, so thank much. Yeah, that was fun. Great. All right. Where are the hookers? <laughs>